Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to be here at the annual PCRI conference. This is my sixth time at this conference, and I want to thank you for viewing this video, and I'm hoping that this will help you in your decision-making about your prostate cancer therapies. Uh, I'm a urologist, uh, I'm a sexual medicine physician, and I work at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. Um, as I'm wont to do, these are my disclosures. So I'm a penis doctor. I'm not an oncologist. When patients come see me, I never interfere with their uh, plans for their cancer therapy, whether it be prostatectomy, radiation, or hormone deprivation. I am direct. I am very straight shooter. And so I'm going to be very honest with you today. And of course, I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm not a prostatectomist. I don't deliver radiation. I don't deliver hormone therapy in prostate cancer patients. I'm a sexual medicine doctor, and I'll help you as best I can at least understand what to expect. I hold all physicians of all kinds to a very high standard. We have a huge responsibility in the management of you and the care and your decision making. And it's our job to give you the best information possible so you can make the best decision for yourself. I'm consumed with the truth and science, ergo the title of the talk. And so I won't present a lot of data today, but I would like you to think that at the end of this, that this is a science-based opinion discussion. I speak very quickly, and if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, uh, this is my handle, Save Your Sex Life. John Hulings Jackson was a neurologist at the beginning of the 20th century, and I love to introduce this topic and many topics with this quote. It takes 50 years to get a wrong idea out of medicine and 100 years to get a right one into it. And the wrong idea is, Mr. Jones, your PSA is undetectable and why aren't you happy? And the right one is that we should be looking at each patient in a holistic fashion and look after everything, including their quality of life, which is the basic tenet of the concept of survivorship. There is nowhere on the prostate cancer journey continuum where sexual dysfunction doesn't play a part, even the man after diagnosis, given that Adrenaline is the world's most potent anti-erection chemical. The stress associated with the diagnosis alone can tip men over into erectile dysfunction. We're only as good as our last erection as a man. So if we have one or two occasions when our erectile function isn't satisfactory, then every time following that is a problem. And it becomes a snowball effect. And it becomes a snowball effect not just on erectile function, but of course men become avoidant when they don't have good erections. I don't play pool very well. How often, Mr. Jones, do you think I play pool? Not very often. The same tenet occurs in the erectile function sphere also. A man who has persistent problems with his erection rigidity or his sustaining capability becomes avoidant. And that's often perceived as low sex drive. Subsequently, men often have problems with rapid ejaculation or even delayed orgasm because the adrenaline load is so huge in the bedroom scenario. Whether it be active surveillance, whether it be definitive treatment in the form of prostatectomy, radiation therapy, or even hormone therapy, or towards the end of the continuum, sexual dysfunction becomes increasingly problematic. So optimal outcomes. To achieve optimal outcomes requires fully informed consent before treatment, which requires that the clinician I use the word clinician very carefully here because a lot of healthcare is now delivered by non-physicians, so nurse practitioners, PAs. It's important that they all give realistic expectations about the effectiveness and the side effects of treatment which sexual dysfunction is one. The word cancer is scary. I certainly understand. I see about 600 new prostatectomy patients a year at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I see about 150 um, radiation patients and about 150 triple therapy patients. Surgery, radiation, and hormone therapy for high risk disease, biochemical recurrence, PSA elevation after surgery, after radiation. So it's a very large volume oncosexology practice. And I understand very well that the term cancer is very scary. But in the vast majority of cases, you have time. You have time to read, to research, to meet more than one physician and make your decision. There are types of prostate cancer that are more urgent, and we can talk about that later during the Q&A session. My goal today is to give you advice to help you enter any treatment program with your eyes wide open. That is the most important thing for me. Remember, I don't do prostatectomies, I don't do radiation therapy, and I don't administer hormone therapy. I just want you 
to be able to do your therapy and look back over your shoulders and have no regrets about your choices. From a treatment effect standpoint, the only sex-friendly uh, strategy is active surveillance or watchful waiting, where no definitive therapy is done. Even in these men, there's PSA anxiety and active surveillance where people are obsessively monitoring their PSAs, and that alone can cause them to have problems with their sexual function. But certainly, prostatectomy, radiation therapy, and hormone therapy can have significant effects, at least transiently and frequently, in a permanent fashion. So the barriers to optimal sexual function outcomes, clinician bias, patient bias, knowledge deficit on behalf of the patient or couple, if one exists, or the clinician, technical expertise factors, whether it be the use of the most modern robot or the use of the most modern radiation therapy delivery systems, technology factors, infrastructure support, and insufficiency in that front. So I happen to have the luxury of having four nurse practitioners and three nurses in my practice that support our penile rehabilitation program, which is very labor, time, energy intensive. And then financial factors. The biggest financial factor historically was of course the cost of these PDE5 inhibitor drugs, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, and Stendra, the four drugs available in the United States. There are several others available throughout the world. But the biggest issue historically was the cost of those drugs, which now in generic forms are very, very affordable. Barriers to good sexual health care, physician discomfort. The average physician gets about two hours of sexual health education during medical school. How can that make the average human being comfortable talking to men about their erections, about their ejaculation, about their orgasm? Almost impossible. By the way, not every urologist is comfortable and not every radiation oncologist is comfortable in having the sex discussion. If you get the sense from those physicians or clinicians that they're not comfortable, then perhaps you should seek somebody who does this for a living. And there are many of us who do this for a living. And if you're interested, you can go to the Sexual Medicine Society of North America at smsna.org for a physician locator. Physician bias. The evidence, I think, is pretty clear that if you go to a prostatectomist, it's very likely you're going to get a prostatectomy. And if you go to a radiation oncologist, it's very likely you'll get radiation therapy. So seeing both in your decision-making process is not unreasonable at all. Physician projection. 72-year-old man diagnosed with prostate cancer, needs therapy, and you've got a 65-year-old physician sitting in the office. Well, Bill, you've had a good innings, right? That's not what we should be thinking. We do not practice ageism in sexual medicine. The only thing that matters to me in my practice is the motivation of the patient or the couple where one exists. The concept of physician as a technician in the modern world, in contemporary medicine, increasingly, radical prostatectomists are just technicians. They'll see you, you need an operation, they do the operation, and then many times, those patients are never seen by that doctor again. They're seen by middle-level practitioners, physician extenders, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants. I don't think that's good medicine. Time constraints in clinical practice is a massive problem. Post-COVID, in revenue recuperation mode, there's pressure on doctors to see more patients in a shorter period of time. This is not a conversation that can be done very rapidly. So when you're going to see your doctor, have your ducks in a row, know what it is that you want to talk about, and if you don't get it talked about in a single visit, don't be afraid to suggest, I'd like to come back on another occasion, Dr. Jones, and I'd like to talk to you more about this. Ageism we've talked about, and then the challenges of the patient with pretreatment erectile dysfunction. There is a concept, certainly, among prostatectomists that if a man has erectile dysfunction at baseline, we don't really need to do nurse-bearing surgery. In fact, there is literature to suggest that men who have baseline erectile dysfunction are five times less likely to get nurse-bearing surgery. Here's the problem. A man who comes in to see me, who's had a diagnosis of prostate cancer for, let's say, the last six months, where he's trying to make his decision about what treatment he's going to pursue, his erectile function a year ago may have been perfect. And the diagnosis of cancer and the stress associated with trying to make a decision may in fact have caused his erectile dysfunction. And his immediate pre-prostatectomy or pre-radiation erectile problems may in fact not be his real true physiology. That his machinery is actually very good. But the decision to save his nerves or not is based on his erection function the week before the operation. Okay? So just be cautious about that. 
Again, you may hear me say this many times during this conversation today, make sure that your treating physician is aware of what your interest is in your future sex life. The single patient, the patient who hasn't had a partner in several years, who hasn't had sexual activity with the partner in several years, may still want to have sexual activity with the partner in the future. If you're a single man undergoing prostate cancer therapy, it's imperative that you declare what your interest in your future sex life is. And then the gay patient. I think it's well accepted that these men get short shrift. There is a level of discomfort among treating physicians in talking to a gay man about his sexuality. Realistic expectations? I think you should seriously think about a referral to a sexual medicine physician before your treatment if your future sexual function is very important to you. I accept that there are people who are probably looking at this for whom it's not that important. Discussion of frequency of the major sexual problems, discussion of the time course. The one, one of the most common errors I see in my practice is men coming in who are thinking, well, my erection should be fine six months after surgery, when in fact that's really an 18 to 24 month time frame. Discussion of ways to minimize long-term effects and discussion of strategies to treat the side effects. Uh, they are really fall into the realm of a sexual medicine physician. I wouldn't expect any urologic oncologist or radiation oncologist to be facile with those discussions. That's where you benefit from seeing a sexual medicine clinician. So there are a host of sexual dysfunctions that are associated with prostate cancer therapies. Many patients have more than one. Erectile dysfunction, the consistent inability to obtain and or maintain an erection sufficient for satisfactory sexual relations. Interestingly, that's a patient's self-report definition. Okay? It doesn't require you to fail 50% of the time. It doesn't require you to have no erections whatsoever. So you decide if your erectile dysfunction is satisfactory or not. Decreased sex drive. Of course, with prostatectomy, all men are never going to ejaculate again. And what's interesting to me is that 40% of prostatectomy patients, when surveyed after surgery, don't remember ever being told that they will never ejaculate again. The most basic sexual problem after prostatectomy, 40% of men don't remember ever being told. That's not necessarily saying that they weren't told. They may just not have remembered. They may be so focused on get rid of my cancer doctor that they don't hear the other topics of conversation during that pre-therapy visit. Difficulty achieving orgasm, reduced orgasmic intensity, orgasmic pain known as dysorgasmia, Sexual incontinence, we have men who were two years after prostatectomy, three years after radiation, who have very good erectile function, but ejaculate urine every time they have an orgasm. Okay, and that's a very stressful thing in the bedroom scenario for some men. And penile length or volume loss, again, another very distressing sexual dysfunction in this population. So the causes of ED after surgery and after radiation are as follows. There's blood vessel damage. The lining of our blood vessels is called the endothelium. It is critically important regulator of blood flow into the penis. All right, so damage to those uh, line, that lining in the blood vessels is a negative thing. Radiation causes that damage, and surgery can cause that damage also. There are blood vessels that travel very close to the prostate called accessory pudendal arteries, which can be damaged at the time of the operation. Nerve injury. That's probably the least important of the three factors in the radiation patient. But in the surgery patient, the maneuvers that the surgeons use to protect those nerves cause nervous nerves to go to sleep. They go to sleep for 9 to 12 months. It takes another 9 to 12 months to wake up fully. That's why erectile functional recovery after radical prostatectomy is an 18 to 24 month time frame. And for the patient who's been told by their surgeon, well, you should be fine in six months, Mr. Jones, and it takes longer than that, that's very distressing and they fall into a sense of hopelessness. Nothing's going to work anymore. They withdraw and they don't even come to see somebody like me. Radiation therapy effects. The maximum effect on erectile function after radiation is probably in the three year mark or even longer. And arteritis obliterans, that endothelial damage that occurs with radiation takes very, very long to happen. So about three years after radiation is typically where we see men reach their nadir, their low point. But the final common pathway to permanent erectile dysfunction after surgery, after radiation, after hormone therapy is smooth muscle damage. And I love the analogy of your penis is like your biceps, Mr. Jones. If you put your arm around, hand around your penis, most of what's inside your penis is a muscle. Think of your arm in a plaster cast for a 12-month period of time. You take the cast off, what happens to your biceps? 
Oh, it undergoes atrophy, Dr. Mahal. That is absolutely correct, and the same thing happens in the penis if we're not getting erections. The problem with atrophy in the penis is that it's permanent. It cannot be reversed. It indeed is not even atrophy, although we use that phrase all the time in clinic. It is collagenization, deposition of collagen scar. So the muscle turns from a nice spongy, like a new sponge you bought, bed, bath, and beyond. Day one, absorbs all this water in the bath, and you're using the same sponge every day for a year, and it turns into a gnarly hard sponge. That's what happens to erectile tissue when erections are not happening. You don't use it, you lose it concept, for sure. And that's the final common pathway to permanent ED. And men with significant muscle damage generally fail to respond to the Viagra drugs and frequently don't respond even to penis injections. So erectile function preservation. As physicians, as surgeons, how can we preserve a person's erectile function? So nerve sparing, right? Now let me make a comment on nerve sparing. The maneuvers that the surgeons use to protect the nerves cause them to go to sleep. So it's routine that even when the nerves were perfectly preserved, that they actually have some level of trauma. When the trauma is mild, they recover. It's called neuropraxia, and those nerves recover over a kind of 18 to 24 month time period. Historically, surgeons will say to you, well, both nerves were saved, bilateral nerve sparing, one nerve was saved, unilateral nerve sparing, or there was no nerve saved, non-nerve sparing. And that really doesn't hold a lot of water in the modern era, because nerve sparing is said to be incremental. There are grades of nerve sparing, depending on which layer of um, tissue the surgeon is operating in. The surgeon, if they do prostatectomies for a living, should know whether the nerves were saved or not. And it's perfectly reasonable for you to speak to the surgeon before surgery and definitely after surgery. I work at an institution that collects um, huge amounts of data, and we have our own grading system. One, the nerves are perfectly preserved. Two, mild damage. Three, moderate damage. Four, the nerve is gone. Erectile functional recovery is very intricately related to the level of nerve sparing. The better the degree of nerve sparing, the better the erectile functional recovery after radical prostatectomy. Preoperative erectile function. The better your erectile function going into surgery, radical prostatectomy, going into radiation therapy, the better your outcomes are going to be, for sure. If your erectile function is poor, that portends a poor prognosis after your treatment. Now, when a patient comes in to see me, as I've alluded to already, I always ask them about their erectile function before their diagnosis of cancer. Because that is, although there's recall bias, got to remember a year ago, let's say, there is still, that's much more important to me than what your erectile function is now, because we know, again, the stress level associated with the diagnosis of cancer and the decision making about which treatment to pursue causes erection problems. Patient age. The older a person is, the less likely they are to do well after surgery. And generally speaking, if you're below 60 years of age, you have good erectile function before surgery, and you have bilateral nerve sparing, high-grade nerve sparing on both sides, the chances of you being a Viagra drug responder at two years after surgery is very, very high. The chances of you being a pill responder in the first few months after surgery is very low. Why? Because those nerves are asleep from the trauma of the manipulation that occurs during the operation. Physician experience and physician volume are very, very important. There's good medical evidence to show that that's absolutely true. Okay? If you've had three years of experience versus 30 years of experience, if you do 10 a year versus 100 a year, these are factors that play into your long-term outcomes. It is not unreasonable, in my opinion, for you to say to a surgeon, by the way, whatever operation you're having done, these are true. How many of these do you do a year? How long have you been doing this, Dr. Jones? Medical conditions. There are several medical conditions that if you have them, are going to make your outcomes worse, whether it's surgery or whether it's radiation therapy. Diabetes is top of the list, obstructive sleep apnea, and very low levels of testosterone. So at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we now routinely measure testosterone levels before surgery. All right? So we know whether the person is starting off with a low testosterone level. Why is testosterone important? Testosterone, would you believe or not, actually is involved in the nerve recovery. If you have very low levels of testosterone, the erection tissue, that muscle gets damaged, but also the nerves fail to recover in an expeditious fashion. Diabetes is bad for nerves. That's why men with diabetes often have a nerve damage in their hands or feet or their bladder or their bowel. 
Okay? And sleep apnea is a very interesting condition. During sleep apnea, the partners are looking, they say, oh, he snores terribly, right? So if you're male, if you're over 50 years of age, you have a neck size over 17 inches, if you snore at night, you're at high risk for obstructive sleep apnea. The problem with sleep apnea is there's fragmentation of sleep. You don't go into REM sleep at night because you're essentially asphyxiating yourself. And that alone hurts erectile tissue. Remember, the average man gets three to six erections every night of his life from the time he goes through puberty. And the purpose of those nocturnal erections is to protect that muscle inside the penis. The absence of those, whether it be post-prostatectomy or a 10-year history of obstructive structural sleep apnea, puts you in a danger category. So these three medical conditions, diabetes, sleep apnea, and very low levels of testosterone, put you at increased risk for long-term sexual dysfunction. If you have androgen deprivation therapy, Vologalix, Lupron, Degarolix, all of these drugs that have been used for decades in the management of prostate cancer patients in association with radiation or as a treatment for advanced disease, androgen deprivation therapy deprives us of our testosterone. I've already told you, very low levels of testosterone are bad for erectile tissue health. And I've already alluded to the pretreatment testosterone levels. So if you have a radical prostatectomy, there are some things to remember. Number one, it has an immediate effect on erectile dysfunction. ED stands for erectile dysfunction. So immediate effect. Have an operation on Tuesday, had sexual activity on a Monday night, Wednesday you'll have no erections. That is the vast majority of patients. 85% of patients at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center within the first three months of radical prostatectomy fail to respond to a PD-5 inhibitor drug. Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, and Stendra. Why? Because those drugs need the nerves to function. And as the nerves, as I said already, go to sleep for a period of time, the pills, it's almost impossible for those pills to do well. And that's where penile injection therapy comes in as a rehabilitation strategy, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The low point in erectile function after radical prostatectomy is about three to four months after surgery. It's very common that men come in to see me and say, well, I had an erection the day after the catheter came out but now I'm not functioning four months later. And if you have an erection, let's say post-op day 10, that's very encouraging. You can imply from that that the nerves are well saved. And what happens is the swelling and the scarring that occur around those nerves after surgery cause those nerves to go into a state of dysfunction and the same pattern, nine to 12 months for recovery, uh, really 18 to 24 months for maximum optimal recovery of those nerves. 20% of men get back to baseline. BTB, back to baseline. I'm the same rigidity after surgery as I was before surgery. But if you look at men who are over 60 years of age, that figure is only 5% of men get back to their baseline function without having to use medications. So if you're 65 years of age, it is extremely unlikely that you're going to get back to the same level of rigidity uh, after surgery that you had before. Doctor, I didn't need to use any pills before the operation. Now, without pills, I no erections in the bedroom. I cannot have sexual intercourse. That figure is about 15% if those men use a Viagra-type drug. So 15% of men over 60 years of age get back to baseline by using medications. In young men, that figure is as high as 60% if they're using medication. Recovery, as I've mentioned before, patient age, erectile function before surgery, and the degree of nerve sparing. And we'll talk about rehabilitation as a concept in a little bit. What about ejaculation? The ejaculation apparatus is removed at the time of radical prostatectomy. The prostate, which contributes about 20% of semen, the seminal vesicles, about 75% of semen, and only 5% of semen is actually sperm. And there is a radical vasectomy done behind the prostate. So the ejaculatory apparatus is gone. And this is why men fail to ejaculate uh, after radical prostatectomy. If you come in to see me after surgery, you say, no, doctor, there's clearly fluid coming out of my penis. If it's watery, it's almost certainly urine, and we'll talk about sexual incontinence in a minute. If it's clear, sticky fluid, what's more vernacularly called pre-cum, it's just secretions from the glands in the urethra, the urine channel, and it is not a true ejaculate. If you happen to be a man for whom reproductive health, fertility, is of interest to you going forward, you need to declare that to your surgeon before surgery. It's not uncommon for me to have to do sperm extraction after prostatectomy because the man had no idea that he would not be able to ejaculate and father children in the future. 
Typically, what we would suggest you do in that scenario is bank sperm before your radical prostatectomy. Orgasmic pain is not that common. It's about 15% of men. The most significant consideration here is that men think that they're doing damage to themselves. They get orgasmic pain, tip of their penis, in the testicles, lower abdomen, perianal area, in and around the time of orgasm. That may last, may last seconds, but sometimes lasts hours. It's usually of a nuisance value on a pain scale from zero to 10, where 10's the worst. There may be a three and a 10 point scale. But we do have men who have crippling pain after orgasm. This is a muscle spasm phenomenon, believed to be, and it is responsive to alpha blocker drugs like tamsulosin or alfuzosin. And that's something that if you have it, first of all, you don't need to worry that you're doing damage to yourself, but you should bring this up to your doctor. Sexual incontinence, leaking urine during sexual activity. There are two kinds. One is called climacteria, leakage of urine at the time of climax. This occurs in about 60% of men on at least one occasion after radical prostatectomy, and about 20% of men consistently throughout the first year. So it's not uncommon at all. For many men, it's very distressing. For many partners, it's very distressing. We tell men when they come to see me pre-prostatectomy, I say, these are the figures. 60% of men will experience this problem on at least one occasion. If it's going to happen at all, it's most probably going to happen in the first half dozen orgasms after radical prostatectomy. If it doesn't happen under those circumstances, it's unlikely to happen in the future. Avoid oral sex, towel on the bed, sexual activity in the shower to avoid this being a problem in the bedroom. Arousal incontinence is very different. There are three things that worsen a man's daytime continence. One is fatigue, not that he feels tired, but the muscles in the pelvis, your Kegel exercise muscles, those muscles get fatigued and can't control urine leak as much. Alcohol relaxes the pelvic floor and men leak more when they've had some alcohol on board. And then sexual activity, not even activity, just thinking about a sexual scenario. Men will say to me, oh, my wife just gives me a massage or she touches me or she intimates that she'd like to make love and I start leaking urine. That's called arousal incontinence. Penile length loss, or penile volume loss, more correctly stated, 70% of men have documentable penile length loss after radical prostatectomy. It averages about one centimeter. Now what happens to the nerves when they get traumatized is they cause that muscle to go into a state of contraction. The penis becomes hypercontractile. So in the early stages after surgery, it's very common that men come in to see me and say, what happened to my penis? It's being brought back into my body. I'm circumcised at birth, but I look uncircumcised now. That's a hypercontractility phenomenon, which is not permanent. However, when men go long periods of time without having good erections, that muscle degenerates, right? That atrophy, uh, biceps, and the penis muscle, arm in a plaster cast for a year, that undergoes degeneration, and that can lead to permanent length loss. It's not uncommon for a man to come in and see me and say, well, my surgeon says my prostate was this long and therefore my penis is gonna be that much shorter. That is untrue. The urethra is fixed inside the pelvis uh, at a layer of muscle called the urodental di diaphragm. So we don't pull the penis in, we actually pull the bladder down to the urethra, okay? So this is early on temporary and resolvable, but in the long term, if you're not able to get erections regularly, if you're not doing rehabilitation, this becomes a significant consideration. What's interesting is there are two papers in the literature that suggest that regular use of these PD-5 inhibitor drugs, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, and uh, Stendra, are protective of erectile tissue. What about with radiation? There's no clear data showing that one radiation modality is better than another. I think all modern therapies, whether it be brachytherapy or external beam, um, whether it be proton therapy, are really more focused than they were 10 or 20 years ago. The problem in the literature is that you've got the proton centers comparing their data, and you've got the brachytherapy centers doing their data, and the external beam people writing up papers on their data, and there's no good comparative studies that really show this. So I don't spend a lot of time talking to patients about what modality of radiation therapy are they going to get. Interestingly, there's a honeymoon effect in most men after radiation where for the first 12 months, at least in men who've had good erectile function before radiation, 
at least in those men, there's very little negative effects of radiation on the erectile function. If they have erectile dysfunction or sexual problems in the first year, it's either most probably psychologically based or if they have been exposed to androgen deprivation therapy, they will see problems early on. The nadir is beyond three years after completion of the radiation for the reasons that I discussed earlier on in this talk. Recovery of erectile function, or probably more correctly stated, preservation of erectile function after radiation is related to patient age, baseline erectile function, dose of radiation, and whether androgen deprivation therapy was used or not. I think the literature is fairly clear now that there is a negative effect of radiation of androgen deprivation therapy on erectile function if used. Certainly if in older men, men over 65 years of age, and certainly if for longer than four months duration of androgen deprivation. Patients come in to see me not infrequently before they've had treatment. I met a radiation oncologist, I met a, a prostatectomist. What should I do, Dr. Mulhall? The first statement out of my mouth is, I'm not a cancer doctor, Mr. Jones. You have to make that decision in association with your cancer doctors. But I do tell them this statement, that the erectile dysfunction rates after radical prostatectomy and radiation therapy approximately three years after intervention are about the same provided you have good nerve sparing, and we're comparing that data to radiation as monotherapy, as a single therapy. If you have poor nerve sparing, that's a problem. If you have radiation therapy, and you have a double up of radiation, which is basically seed placement first with external beam after, that's very high dose. Those erectile dysfunction rates are higher. And likewise, when androgen deprivation therapy has been included. So it actually is very difficult to compare the two. They're a bit like apples and oranges. But essentially, good nurse bearing, radiation monotherapy, there is no difference in erectile dysfunction rates uh, three plus years after intervention. After radiation, interestingly, and almost no patients know this, 90% of men, a period of five years after radiation therapy, have no semen that the radiation effects on the prostate, on the ejaculation ducts is such that they too also no longer ejaculate, just like every man who has a radical prostatectomy. There's very little evidence on orgasmic function after radiation therapy. And there's no data on sexual in uh, incontinence and penile length loss or volume loss in this population. What about androgen deprivation therapy? So um, I understand that this is critical in the care of many men with prostate cancer. Okay? The problem with having no testosterone, this is not just my testosterone level is low. This is basically I have no testosterone. I have undetectable testosterone levels, particularly with the newer agents, which are so effective at reducing testosterone. And it causes this erectile tissue degeneration, this atrophy, this collagen deposition, which again, as I said before, is permanent. Permanent ED appears to be associated with the use of ADT, for what any reason, for longer than six months. The other issue to be aware of is that not every man who is exposed to androgen deprivation therapy will have recovery to normal levels of testosterone. The predictors of that phenomenon, where men are left with low testosterone long term, are men over 65 years of age, having a low baseline testosterone before hormone therapy, and more than six months of hormone therapy. The problem with the erectile tissue degeneration is it leads to the inability to respond to drugs like Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, and Stendra. If you have no testosterone, you cannot make semen. Even if you have an orgasm, you will not be able to produce semen. Semen is an androgen, testosterone-dependent activity. If you look at men who are on, actively on hormone therapy or who have very low levels of testosterone after hormone therapy has been ceased, those men really struggle with having an orgasm. More than 90% of those men are, are, fail to achieve an orgasm, or anorgasmic. Sex drive, likewise, more than 90% of men, while actively on hormone therapy, fail to have any significant sex drive. Now, sex drive is a very interesting thing to talk about as a sexual medicine physician, because sex drive comes in two fashions. Number one is called visceral sex drive. Right? That is testosterone dependent for nearly every, every man. I see an erotic image, I think of something erotic, and I get aroused and I want to have sexual activity. That's visceral. If you have no testosterone for 90 plus percent of men, they do not have any sex drive. On a zero to 10 point sex drive scale, where 10 is I can't stop thinking about sex, and zero is I never think about it, what number are you, Mr. Jones? Oh, I'm a zero to a one doctor. 
Intellectual sex drive is entirely different. I love my partner, we used to have great sex, I want to have sex, that's intellectual. That is testosterone independent. So there are many men who have an absence of visceral sex drive while on hormone therapy, who actually have retention of intellectual sex drive. Penile length loss, if the muscle degenerates, that is the bulk of the erectile tissue. I told you when a man puts his hand around his penis, most of what's inside his hand is a muscle. When that muscle degenerates, there is length and volume loss. And that is most certainly associated with androgen deprivation therapy, especially when it's more than six months in duration. I'm gonna make some declarative statements and I'll talk to you about what I mean uh, over the next few slides. And this, I hope, will help you in your understanding of what you need to do before your treatment to get the best sexual function, recovery, or preservation. We're in a phase now where we have what I call obsessive oncocentricity. Oncocentricity is the absolute focus on cancer outcomes. In prostate cancer, of course, it'll be your PSA, prostate-specific antigen, okay? But we cannot just, akin to what John Hewlings Jackson said, that quotation I used at the beginning of the lecture, we cannot just focus on the PSA when perhaps to the individual patient or couple, their sexual activity or their continence, their quality of life may be critically important. You think that your treating clinician will tell you all that you need to hear when in fact the physician will tell you what they think you need to hear. So if your sexual function is really important to you, it would be very important for you to go in there and declare that that's the case. It would be very important for you to make a list of the questions you want answered by that physician. If that physician doesn't have the expertise to answer those questions, seek a consultation with somebody who does. And if you don't get all of your questions answered, I would go back on another occasion and have those questions answered. I have many men who see me twice before their prostatectomy or their radiation. You mentioned something the first day, Dr. Mulhall, I want to ask some more questions about that. Just be cognizant that physicians are under tremendous time crunches. So go in with good questions written out on a, on a notepad so you know what you're going to ask. And if you don't get them asked, go back on another occasion. Don't be afraid to ask why active surveillance is not an option for you. For many, many years, Gleason 6 cancer, Gleason 3 plus 3 on biopsies, we had a radical prostatectomy or radiation. We now rarely operate on those patients because we know that nearly all of those patients survive and do very well on active surveillance protocols. So I think it's very reasonable if you have Gleason 6 cancer, even if you have Gleason 3 plus 4, perhaps not so much Gleason 4 plus 3, but in those categories, it's not unreasonable for you to say to the doctor, would active surveillance be an option for me? Before committing to a treatment, think seriously about how important your future sex life is. If you're a single man, that's a decision that only you can make. But if you're in a couple, I think that's important to have that discussion. I have many men who come in to see me post-prostatectomy who really don't understand or know what their partner's attitude is to sexual activity going forward. They've been married for 35 years and they've never spoken about their sex life. That is routine. We have a phrase in my practice, patient will go home and have the talk, in quotations, with his partner to try to find what their future uh, interest is, their future goals and aspirations, and what kind of sexual activity they're interested in. I have many couples who have fantastic sex life and only have sexual outer course, non-intercourse based sexual relations. That's fine for many people, but for some people it is not. So it's very worthwhile as a team sitting down and talking about this in a casual and non-confrontational fashion. Understand what your treating physician means by erectile function, preservation, or recovery. There are lots of different definitions. The definition, as I mentioned earlier, for erectile dysfunction is the consistent absence of being able to get or keep an erection. Both of those two things. Consistent, which means usually for a few months, right? Nowhere in that definition does it state with the use of Viagra or with the use of penis injections. But much of the literature, including some prostatectomy studies that suggest, for example, that 97% of men have really good erections after surgery, don't tell you that those patients were the youngest patients, the best nerve sparing patients, and who were on pills or injection therapy to get those good erections. So make sure you're clear what your individual physician means by erection function recovery. I would say to you, that let's say, for example, you've decent erections one out of every 10 times, 
and nine out of ten times you're unable to have intercourse, you're not going to be happy if intercourse is important to you. So consistency of response is also important, not just rigidity, not just sustaining capability, but the consistency of your erections in a sexual scenario. Get realistic expectations about the time frame. I've already alluded to three years after radiation and 18 to 24 months after radical prostatectomy. Talk to your physicians about that. This is Memorial Sloan Kettering data. On the x-axis on the bottom there is time, months from radical prostatectomy. On the left side, recovery of erection function, good enough for intercourse without the use of a medication. And you can see that it continues to improve out to 24 months. So it'll be two years after surgery for the vast majority of men before I'll say to them, Mr. Jones, this is as good as it's going to get. This is erectile functional recovery after radiation. On the x-axis, you see different time points. 12 months after radiation, 24 months after radiation, and 36 months. And the white bars are the entire group. And the uh, gray bar there, it's the group of men who had radiation therapy without hormone therapy. And the black bar is the men who got radiation with hormone therapy. And you can see out the three years, there's a steady decline in erectile function, this is, use, this is with the use of a PD-5 inhibitor. And you can see those men who have hormone therapy tend to do more poorly than those men who don't. I am never going to interject and say you shouldn't have hormone therapy. That's a cancer doctor's decision, not mine. Beware physicians citing incredible figures for erectile function recovery or preservation. You need to look at the literature as it exists at the moment with a slightly jaundiced eye in the sense that single center, single surgeon, or single radiation therapy uh, outcome papers, literature, is much better than those, those papers where there's multi-center, older men, the Medicare series, the SEER Medicare database. Those outcomes are always much worse than the single surgeon, single center series. I'll give you an example. A famous surgeon has done 2,500 radical prostatectomies and the paper only has 250 of them, right? Often what happens is there's cherry picking done when data is being analyzed. The youngest men, the best nerve sparing, the best erectile function before surgery are those who are presented in the paper. And of course, those numbers are always going to be better than the older man who had slightly poor erections before surgery and had less than perfect nerve sparing. This is called a systematic review, which basically means the data is um, uh, heavily statistically analyzed. And the red box is around the erectile function recovery two years after surgery in the literature with the use of a medication. And you can see that this is about 55 to 60 percent of men, which is a very reasonable estimate for men's ability to have intercourse after radical prostatectomy. But that means that there's 40 percent of men who will be incapable of having intercourse in the long term, even with the use of a PD-5 inhibitor medication. Back to baseline, I already alluded to it. On the left-hand side, you've got age, less than 60 years of age, or 60 years of age or greater. And then the next column is using PD-5 inhibitors at 24 months to get back to baseline. And you can see that almost one half of men under 60 years of age can get back to baseline uh, using pills. And that figures about 16% of men who are over 60 years of age. If you go to the far right-hand column, not using any pills at 24 months to get back to baseline. That figures about one in four men under 60 years of age and about 4% of men who are over 60 years of age. So for the 65-year-old man coming into radical prostatectomy who sees me before surgery, I communicate very clearly. It is not likely that you will ever get back to baseline. And of course, when the surgeon comes out after surgery and says, Mrs. Jones, everything went great, what do patients think? I'll never be incontinent, my erections will be great, and my PSA will never recur. Okay? Back to baseline is very difficult to accomplish. If you have ED before treatment and sexual intercourse is important, it is essential that you communicate it's important to the treating physician. When I see patients before surgery, or even before radiation, but to the surgery patients, I always say the same thing. The morning of your operation, the day of your operation, the surgeon comes to see you before the operation, don't be afraid to reiterate, to mention again that, you know doctor, my sexual function is critically important to myself and my partner, right? Very, very important. Or even if you're single, if it's very important to you, okay? Making that declaration before the surgeon goes back and sees you, it might have been a month or two months before since the surgeon has seen you last, don't be afraid to declare that again. 
open versus robotic radical prostatectomy. So I think I'm correct in saying that in 2003, almost no prostatectomies were done using the robot. And now the overwhelming majority of prostatectomies are done using the robot. In fact, there are uh, urologists in training, urology residency, residency programs where the, the young surgeons never see an open prostatectomy anymore. The bottom line is, there really is no evidence to show that using the robot, that sexual function, urinary function, or cancer outcomes are any different, although it's $4,000 extra per operation. Saying that, the young surgeons will be trained only in the robot, and it's almost certainly the only thing that's going to be available to you. Physician experience is key to success. We mentioned this already. This is data uh, from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. This is Andrew Vickers and James Eason's data on the x-axis is surgeon experience. Lifetime experience as the primary surgeon with radical prostatectomy. On the left-hand side, the five-year probability of being free from biochemical recurrence at PSA elevation. There are slides we could put up showing incontinence or erectile function on the left-hand side, and it's always the same. There's a learning curve involved in this. This is very interesting, complicated slide, but let me break it down for you. On the x-axis, the probability of having leakage of urine, incontinence, 12 months. On the y-axis, probability of having erectile problems. The circles are the lifetime experience. The bigger the circle, the greater the lifetime experience of the surgeons at Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center. So intuitively, you would think that those surgeons who've been longer in practice with the greatest lifetime experience are going to be in the top right-hand corner of the graph, and the ones with the least experience are going to be in the bottom left. And that's not the case. This heterogeneity was quite surprising to us when we saw this. And the bottom line is that surgeons either do a good radical prostatectomy or they don't sometimes not completely directly related to their experience or the volume that they do. Okay? So you can see on this graphic there are some very tiny circles top right and some big circles at the bottom left. So choose wisely and that's a difficult challenge for you. How do you know what kind of surgeon you should choose? I will tell you almost certainly listening to your primary care physician about which surgeon you should have your prostatectomy with is probably not the best way to choose. Almost certainly that PCP has never been in the operating room with the surgeon. The surgeon might be a good communicator, might be a nice person, might be humble, might be honest, sure. But the technical expertise is something that you really need to think about more carefully and that's very difficult for you to figure out. Penile rehabilitation is the concept, whether you're a prostatectomy or a radiation patient, where we can do things to keep that muscle healthy while we're waiting for the nerves to recover from the trauma of surgery. Okay? So we talked about the arm in a plaster cast and the biceps atrophy and how atrophy in the penis is permanent. We can prevent that atrophy to a large extent after prostatectomy and to an extent in radiation patients by doing penile rehabilitation. Now there are plenty of people uh, in urology who will say, well, penile rehabilitation, show me the evidence that that actually works. Level one evidence-based medicine, large randomized placebo-controlled trials, which of course is the gold standard in proving that something is effective or safe. Right? They just don't exist. There are three papers in the literature, all industry-sponsored, one showing a benefit to rehab and two showing no benefit, although there are all kinds of problems in the latter two studies. Now I am probably the world's most avid penile rehabilitation specialist. So you have to bear that in mind as I say what I'm saying, but I would consider that if your future sex life is important to you, and if you don't want to go the rest of your life incapable of having sexual intercourse, why wouldn't you do penile rehabilitation after your prostatectomy or after radiation? Because the cornerstone of rehabilitation is just regular use of Viagra-type drugs, right? And if you're responding to those drugs, if you're getting a penetration hardness erection, that's all you need to do. As I mentioned earlier, they're just generally very, very cheap now. It used to be $60 for 100 milligrams of Viagra. Now you can get 100 milligrams for probably less than $2. Okay? Likewise, after radiation, why wouldn't you do penile rehabilitation to maximize your erectile function preservation? In men who don't respond, so these pills in the early stages after surgery, which I already told you, is about 85%. Those men are faced with a decision about doing penis injection therapy to protect their muscle. I don't care if you have sex, Mr. Jones, or not. I don't care if you have an orgasm, but I do care. Blood flow, 
oxygen into your penis and stretch of that muscle, which is what nocturnal nighttime or early morning erections do for erectile tissue. There's no clear difference in sexual outcomes uh, between the different radiation therapy modalities. I've already mentioned this. There's no clear evidence to show one is better than another, provided you're comparing radiation monotherapy from center to center to center. ADT is unfortunately the most penis-threatening thing you can be exposed to. I don't interfere with cancer care, but I do say to patients, why don't you speak to your doctor about what the survival benefit is? Now, this is very important when we get patients who are having radiation therapy, for example, and they're getting adjunctive hormone therapy, androgen deprivation therapy, and there's a discussion about whether that should be 6, 12, 18, or 24 months. That's where this concept of speaking to your doctor and asking them about the survival benefit of different durations of ADT. Remember I told you that durations beyond six months are very challenging for erectile tissue and generally lead to uh, erectile tissue collagen deposition scarring, which generally leads to dependence upon penile injection therapy. When we see patients who've had triple therapy, surgery, radiation therapy, and hormone therapy, less than 5% of patients ever respond to a pill. And most of those patients need injections, and 50% of them will never respond to injections if they have triple therapy. Now, it's not zero, but it's only one in two chance if you've had triple therapy. If you need androgen deprivation therapy, don't be afraid to ask about how long does the doctor think you'll be testosterone deficient. So let's say you're on six months of Lupron, and Lupron stops. It takes a while for it to wash out. Okay, a few months for it to go away completely. And if you're 70 years of age, it might take you one to two years to get a normal testosterone level back, which essentially means you'll have spent two to three years being profoundly hormone deficient. The problem with no testosterone is it's well established. It's associated with osteoporosis, diabetes, or worsening diabetes, worsening sugar control if you already have diabetes, and premature cardiovascular events, heart attacks and strokes. Now, I'm not talking about low testosterone. I'm talking about extremely low testosterone or no testosterone. So there are some problems with being uh, left permanently testosterone deficient. If you're prescribed PD-5 inhibitors, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, or Stendra, you should really get instructions on how to use them properly. It's still remarkable, 20 plus years after these drugs were introduced, where men walk into my office and they're not using the drugs properly, and they're failing, in quotations, failing, but they haven't really failed. And there's very good literature to suggest that at least one in three men who walk into the office of a urologist having been prescribed a PD-5 inhibitor by a non-urologist, and they say, it doesn't work, they've actually not used it properly. So Viagra, which is sildenafil, Levitra, which is Vardenafil, and Stendra, which is Avanafil, they are short-acting PD-5 inhibitors. Peak level is about one to two hours after ingestion. An empty stomach is ideal. If you take these pills, and these pills are in your stomach at the same time as food or alcohol, you're gonna drop the uh, dose by about 30%, and you double the time it takes for those medications to get absorbed. Sexual stimulation is required. I tell our patients that, uh, who are using, let's say, Viagra, Levitra, or Stendra, I say, dinner at seven, Take the medication at five. The pill will be in and out of your stomach before food or alcohol go in there, and you have a six to eight hour window. You're good till around midnight, Mr. Jones. That's the way to remember how to use those pills. If you're using these pills and they're not working, but you're not doing each of those things, empty stomach, sexual stimulation, and the duration of activity, then it's worthwhile going back and trying them again. Viagra Levitra, an eight to 10 hour window in standard is about a six hour window, a window of opportunity where the drug is active. Side effects are the same for all three drugs, headache, flushing, congestion, uh, nasal congestion, heartburn, and visual effects. 15% of men at maximum dose get headache, 10% get facial flushing, 7% get heartburn, 4% get nasal congestion, and 2% get visual disturbances. Blurred vision, double vision, or this loss of color vision. It happens to cross-react with an enzyme in the retina. That's not a major concern, okay? All these side effects are usually mild. It's less than 3% of men who drop out of our PD-5 inhibitor program because of side effects. If you happen to have um, retinal disorders such as macular degeneration or retinitis pigmentosa, I am going to require you to have ophthalmological clearance, clearance from your uh, eye doctor before you will use these pills. 
What about Cialis, which is Tadalafil? Well, there's no food effect. There's no food impact on Cialis. However, it's a much more slowly absorbed drug, but it has a much longer lasting drug. This is a drug which typically takes about four hours to have its maximum effect, but it'll hang around for at least 24, if not 36 hours for individual patients. The side effects for Tadalafil are the same as uh, the other ones, except it's got a lower instance of visual side effects, but it has a, a different side effect of what are called myalgias, muscle aches. So, so long are these drugs in the, in the system that the large muscles, the blood gets stagnant in those muscles, and there's muscle aches in the butt, in the thighs, or in the lower back. Penile injection therapy sounds awful, but it's the best drug therapy you have for ED. And I always say to patients the same thing. Never base your decision about penis injections on the mental imagery. I would like you to come in and try an injection, Mr. Jones, and if that day, injections, you say, now I know I can't do it, that's an informed decision. But it's a 29 gauge needle, mosquito bite, placed into the middle of the shaft. In my program, the average man gets an erection within five to 10 minutes, and that erection's lasting uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and the average man is getting an 80% erection. Okay, if you come to see me within six months of your radical prostatectomy, you have a 92% chance of being an injection therapy responder. So it's a very, very effective, very safe form of therapy. The only risk with penile injections is the risk of getting priapism. From TV, erections lasting longer than four hours, call your doctor, that's called priapism. The problem with priapism is that it deprives the penis of oxygen. And very much like a heart attack, where a blood vessel is blocked and the muscle is getting no oxygen, in the penis, the muscle is getting no oxygen. And this is an absolute urological emergency. In my practice, at two hours they take 120 milligrams of Sudafed, at three hours they're calling us, and at four hours they need to be in the emergency room. That is the protocol for priapism prevention in our practice. And priapism rates in our practice are 0.2%, directly related to the level of education and monitoring of patients in the injection program. Triple therapy, surgery, radiation, hormone therapy, whatever order they occur in, doesn't necessarily mean that your sex life is over. I already told you that although the muscle degenerates, 50% of men who have had triple therapy are good penile injection responders. Remember, your ability to make PSA is dependent upon your testosterone level. So the PSA, the enzyme, prostate-specific antigen, is dependent on testosterone. If you don't have enough testosterone, you may not be able to generate PSA. Now this is very important in men, let's say, who come in after radical prostatectomy, and they're, let's say, six months after prostatectomy, and their PSA is non-detectable, as it should be, but their testosterone level is incredibly low. There's a new movement in place for uh, intramuscular testosterone challenge. Give the man testosterone. Let's see what happens with his PSA. Testosterone level will go up five days later. If his PSA doesn't change, then that patient may well be a very good candidate for testosterone therapy. If the PSA changes, that becomes a cancer discussion with the doctors, with the doctors who look after that patient. My testosterone level is low. I have symptoms. Can I receive testosterone therapy? The American Urological Association guidelines on testosterone therapy, of which I'm the chairperson, state very categorically, there is yet not enough evidence to show that testosterone therapy is safe, and I would extrapolate that, or dangerous, in the radical prostatectomy, active surveillance patient, or the patient who had radiation therapy for their prostate cancer. You probably need tens of thousands of men followed for 15 years to really answer that question. But I will tell you, our data at Memorial Sloan Kettering are surprisingly clean. That men with organ confined, Gleason 6, Gleason 7 cancer, there's no increased risk of uh, prostate cancer recurrence in those patients. Our active surveillance patients likewise, and we're still accumulating our radiation therapy patients on that front. Beware of false advertising regarding restorative therapies. This is a hot subject now, especially in metropolitan areas where restorative therapies such as shockwave therapy, stem cell therapy, or platelet-rich plasma are being put forward as a treatment for erectile dysfunction, including in the prostate cancer patients. I'll bottom line this for you. There is no credible evidence to show that these drugs are of any significant benefit, these therapies are of any significant benefit in the prostate cancer patient. There's no evidence to suggest that there are any harm, perhaps other than to your wallet, because these are all cash therapies, and there's a tremendous conflict of interest here. 
You go see a physician. Many physicians who uh, advertise and administer these therapies are not actually even urologists. There are other kinds of physicians, anti-aging physicians who are tagging on these therapies uh, in a package for you, right? Cash business, cash business conflict of interest, right? I think it's very unlikely you're going to get a balanced discussion from those physicians uh, when they're pitching these therapies to you. Words of advice to the partner. I see many, many partners. In fact, I'm more likely to see partners in my practice of the men who've got prostate cancer than the men who don't have prostate cancer. And so I think be supportive as best as you can. Never emasculate your man. And don't be afraid, just like the, the man needs to be proactive, whether the partner is female or male, okay? Be proactive in your concerns and your discussions with, your, with the, uh, the man who has prostate cancer. And don't be afraid to broach the subject. Perhaps we should go see somebody who specializes in this condition and will get you fixed. And finally, let us not focus solely on adding years to life but also pay attention to adding life to years. This is a survivorship concept, and we shouldn't be focused entirely on a man's PSA. We should be looking at the whole patient. And with that, thank you very much. Hello, how are you, my friend? 25 years we've had a relationship. It's my pleasure to be here. Really? Is it because I'm here with you? 100%. That's, a, that's the perfect answer. We have a lot to cover. First of all, I'm not trying to be obsequious here, that was, you've done this talk many times, that will end up being the most informative talk for patients, in my opinion, on the subject. Well done, sir. I hope so, this, I hope so, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely, this is the equivalent in your world of winning the Rugby World Championship. Does that help? It would be great if Ireland won it, yeah. <laughs> Does Ireland have any chance of winning it? Number one in the world. All right, I wanna bring up a slide for you to take a look at. Sure. That's my dog. Grazie. Yeah. yeah, see, very attentive, very excited you're here. And so I wanted to have a little levity before we go into something, which I hope is the only slide that is 100% serious the rest of the way, because it's always fun having a little levity with you. Mm -hmm. All right, I didn't want to do this, but before I pull up the next slide, I did not want to do this, but I thought I've known you such a long time that I think it's important for the audience that we talk about this because it threw me for a loop and I want to just see how this relates to all everything that's going on. Now, when it says, how are you my BFF? When I talked to you on the phone and you told me you were going through a health situation, yeah. that's all I heard. Yeah. I didn't want to hear anything else about life. So can you please tell our audience where you've been and where you're going and why this is a big deal. As I said to you on the phone, this is a very eventful summer. I was diagnosed with a brain tumor um, probably three months ago. Relatively asymptomatic, picked up on an incidental MRI. And um, it's inside the, one of the fluid-filled spaces in my brain, uh, the lateral ventricle. Mm -hmm. But I had unilateral hydrocephalus from, from that. It'd been there a while. And what's but, unilateral hydrocephalus mean? It, that, so the fluid-filled spaces just get bigger and bigger. So there was a shift of the brain from the fluid accumulation. And I was asymptomatic. And asymptomatic. The likelihood, they told me, was that it was benign. And of course, I'm a surgeon, so uh, everything was focused on, let's pick the right surgeon, let's do the right operation, let's get it done. But how it relates to the talk today is that there was a tremendous emotional component after surgery. Everything great, it was a benign tumor, fully resected, no further treatment required. However, there was that, oh my God, yeah. I had a brain tumor. So when I put up the slides saying cancer is scary, even to a surgeon, yeah. it's scary. So, you know, I can, I think, relate even better now. I'm 26 years in practice. I think I can relate better now to my patients in understanding, you know, that fear factor that strikes them upon the diagnosis. So this was just three months ago? Yeah. My and modeling career is over. No, your, uh, your with modeling career is fine. With the, <laughs> with the scalp incision, but yeah. Yeah, so it really hit hard after. Not so much before, but after, for sure, yeah. No symptoms, incidental MRI. And how much time did you take off after the surgery? Six weeks. That's it? Yeah, and I was bored for the last two weeks, so I was you were? <laughs> Yes, yes. You know me. <laughs> I think, but I, also, I do know you, but I also think, and I've known a lot of people who have run into this situation who are friends. And it always seems like there's one of two responses. 
oh my gosh, I'm done with medicine. I'm gonna go sail the world. I'm gonna go find some other calling. I've, there's only so much life left. The other response is, I'm more dedicated than ever to doing what I wanna do. Is, it sounds like your response was the latter. <clears throat> well, well, first of all, it was a benign tumor, right? So if no, I know, a, but you know, some of these benign tumors can grow and be a problem. I, well, obviously I had- The word know, benign uh, tumor is an oxy, as an oxymoron, right? It's just fine, funny. Yeah. Listen, if it had been glioblastoma multiforme, yeah. of course I would have traveled the world and et cetera, et cetera, but it wasn't. So we just, you know, we're, <clears throat> we're all faced with these challenges. We get on with it and move on. And, you know, I'm 61 years of age. I have 25-year-olds in my practice at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center who have less than three years to live from some rare cancer. Yeah. So, you know, it gives you tremendous perspective on life. Yeah. And I think that you and I are certified work workaholics, recovering now, right? Yeah. So I think our focus now is on trying to do things outside of work as well, yeah. as much as possible. You remember that first day you went back into work after the whole thing was taken care of? Your first hour seeing patients again, was that a little was, bit, bit different in terms of enthusiasm or? No. no. No, it was the same. I mean, I was working at home for the last two weeks, you know, doing academic stuff. I'm an editor of a journal. The journal had to be maintained while I was away for the four weeks I was away from the journal and stuff. But no, just get right back into it. And can I jump into that for a second? People don't realize out there that there is a major global journal, Journal of Sexual Medicine. Mm -hmm. We call it JSM in the biz. Yeah. And it's the definitive authority, in my opinion, not just saying this because you're here, in terms of breaking news and also reviews and what goes on in sexual health. And you're the editor-in-chief, right? For one more year, yeah. One be, more I'm, year. In, I'm moving into my 10th year now. And uh, pass it on to the next generation and new ideas. So yeah, no, it's, a, it's definitely a labor of love, but I think it's a huge role to play in academics and crafting what the literature looks like, what gets uh, published and what doesn't get published. Yeah, well, I'm just glad you're okay, because all I remember is we, we were talking on the phone, you said I had, I had a brain tumor, it's benign, and I, I, that's all I heard. I didn't want to talk about anything else. I, was, I didn't know where, where this was going. Yeah, I'm, I'm back. I'm glad you're good. I'm glad you're, you're back. Okay, let's bring my next slide up. Okay, let me preface this. You had this book out a long time ago. It was very hot. People love it. It was my go-to book for learning everything I needed to learn before during treatment and after treatment, how to save the sex life. And, but it's not out there anymore. Can you at least, for people that are trying to get a hold of it, and some people are paying too much for it, I know, because there's sort of illegal copies out of there. Can you tell us where this is going? And maybe you might give us an idea of, besides this talk, where people can go for good advice. I'm not a, a massive self-promoter, so I, I don't want to be you know, overly, um, I don't want to discuss this overly uh, too much. Um, there was an absence of a book written for patients that wasn't written by either a surgeon or a radiation oncologist who was a dog in the fight or somebody who was a real expert. And you know, you know I'm a certified oncosexologist, right? I work at a cancer center, 600 new prostatectomy patients a year, hundreds of radiation and triple therapy patients. So this was an effort to try guide people, very much like the lecture, guide people eyes wide open what to expect, okay? Um, it was published in 2008. The publisher that published it, Hilton Publishing, I think has gone out of business. And a second edition is in progress. So I'm okay. hoping in the next year that there will be a second edition. Sadly, in some chapters, there hasn't been a lot of developments in other areas for sure. Yeah. But I, I think that, again, just trying to empower the prostate cancer patient, wherever they are on their journey, to make the best decision for themselves. Well, I mean, if people can still get a hand on a, ch on a chapter, I still have my copy of the book, actually. And it was underlined in red, because I'm a traditionalist with that underlining thing like you. So at least the next edition will be out at some point so people can look forward to that, right? It'll be easier when I don't have the journal responsibilities, which is a massive responsibility, but. But it makes me also think of the Sexual Medicine Society. Now, you and I know what that means, the SMS group. Right. I guarantee you the vast majority of people out there don't know what it means. Can you just give a little yeah. bit of a, a plug on what SMS is and why it's important for patients? Yeah, so the Sexual Medicine Society of North America, okay. so that accounts America, for uh, United important. States and Canada, uh, is a professional organization devoted to dissemination of credible information, uh, conduct research, uh, education, and training of the new generation 
of uh, sexual medicine physicians. Most of the members are going to be urologists because it's an affiliate of the American Urological Association, but we've got a, a psychologist, actually the psychologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Chris Nelson, is the current treasurer of SMSNA. Uh, they have two websites, one for physicians, on which there is a um, member locator, so patients can go on there and try to find uh, where uh, their local sex med expert would be. But they also have a, a patient website called Sex Health Matters. Okay. So if I type in sexual health matters, sex health matters, sex health matters dot org, that's the patient site. Yeah. Okay. So um, there's lots of information on there, you know, didactic information, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. You can submit questions, there's topics, there's archived topics on there. So it's a very useful resource yeah. for people. If you happen to live in New York or Chicago, LA, there's going to be several sex med experts in the city. But if you're in more rural areas, it can be a challenge to find somebody close to you. But the information you provide, the education you provide, and if this is one of those gold nuggets here that if patients watching this can just go to some of those websites, it's pretty brilliant information. Yeah. I mean, there's some powerhouse people working with you on some of these committees. Sure. One of them is my colleague, uh, Daniela Whitman, yeah. who I like very much and puts out great material. So I'm just glad you mentioned that because that's another educational resource that I think is still underutilized. You raise, a, you raise an important point. In the modern era where the web rules and social media rules, as a consumer of that material, you have to be careful what you're going to believe and what you're not going to believe. I'm not sure I love the word fake news, but there's fake information out there, right? Yeah. So I think that you just have to be very careful. You need to make sure that you're going, as a consumer, to credible websites with credible information. Yeah. That's not always the case. So that's great. We're getting a lot of stuff on my checkbox. So now let's shift this and let's shift and talk about an area I like to talk about, which is the area of lifestyle and over the counters. Whether I know it's controversial, but let's first talk lifestyle before I move to my next slide. One of my favorite papers, I, I looked at every single paper that you published in the past 20 years before I came here because I have no life. <laughs> I didn't read the whole paper, I just reminded myself what you were sure. doing. One of my favorite that I don't think got a lot of attention and maybe it will strike up in your memory and I know you're still following this kind of data, is that when you looked at Sloan and I think other places, before people had treatment, the health of the person going into the treatment was very much a factor of how they were gonna do in terms of side effects. In other words, I read that paper as heart healthy as erection healthy. In other words, the more heart healthy the patient was, the more likely their outcomes would be better. And I'm giving it a simplistic answer, but can you elaborate on that? Sure. I think it's an important yeah. message. I mean, the, the phrase to remember would be, what's good for your heart is good for your penis. Uh -huh. The penis is a big blood vessel. It's a big, it's like an artery in the erect state. It's like a big vein in the flaccid state, right? Right. So uh, look after your blood pressure. Look after your cholesterol. Look after your sugar. Exercise. If you were to choose one thing to do to protect your penis, it's a, a structure that's laden with endothelium. And exercise is yeah. so good for endothelium. When we take men who come into our office who have an ultrasound for whatever reason, measuring blood flow in the penis, and they're 70 plus years of age, and they've got perfectly normal blood flow, 100% of them are exercisers. That's right? interesting. So blood pressure control, lipid control, sugar control, as best as you can, reduce stress, Yeah. right? And so this concept that we want to be getting erections all the time, the purpose of that, those nocturnal erections that a healthy man gets regularly, is to protect the endothelium and the muscle inside the penis. Yeah. So what's good for your heart is good, good for, for the penis, penis. right? Yeah. So they're, they're the key things to remember, right? Oh, that's fantastic because I'm sure a million patients ask you before they have a procedure, when it's done, what can I do now to preserve function? Sure. Yeah. And I know they want to hear about all the latest, greatest expensive drugs or not so expensive products. Right. But the idea that heart healthy is head to toe healthy or what's good for the heart is good for the penis, is good for your sexual health is one of the most important messages that can be sold. Let me tell you how much that gets into my brain when I'm thinking about you. So I, when I flew from Alaska yesterday to be here, they, at Delta Airlines, they gave me this, they gave me this tiny little st straw to stir things. And I remember I attended a lecture of yours, I think it was 10 or 12 years ago, and you were mentioning the diameter of the blood vessels that feed the penis. They're very tiny. So 
if, if you look at this, I thought this is a couple millimeters. This is probably the size of a blood vessel that feeds your penis. Yes Point or no? 0.5 millimeters in the flaccid state. 0.5. 1 to 1.2 in the erect state. 1 to 1.2 millimeters. millimeters. And our coronary arteries are 2 to 3 millimeters. 2 to 3. Right? Okay. So this is why erectile dysfunction is a harbinger of cardiovascular disease, a predictor. Yeah. Right? So if a man comes in, even in the absence of cardiovascular risk factors, no known hypertension, no known hyperlipidemia, right? Cholesterol and blood pressure are fine. If they come in with ED, there's an increased instance of the men, those men, yeah. developing cardiovascular disease over the next five to 10 years. And that is as strong, this is data from the PCPT, the Prostate Cancer Prevention Trial. Yeah. If you follow men who come in with ED and you follow them, they're just as likely to get, it's a stronger predictor of future car, uh, myocardial events, heart attacks, yeah. as cigarette smoking is, right? Yeah. So ED is a future predictor of coronary artery disease, right? Yeah, so. so. If you're 45 years of age and we do an ultrasound of your penis and you have low blood flow in your penis, right? We send those men off to see a cardiologist mm. to get evaluated. Right. Now, of course, it's not just exercise stress. This is all kinds of funky um, anatomical and functional studies that can be done to look at that man's heart. But this is a real entity. Yeah. And it's been estimated that ED predates the onset of angina by three to five years. Mm. Yeah, because you're talking about these tubes that are so tiny that the coronary arteries actually are much bigger than these. So if something's going to happen early, it's going to happen here early, right? Right. It happens in the penis before it happens in the, the heart. You'll, you'll never look at a coffee stirrer the same way. Will you? Well, I've been looking like that for years. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on lifestyle? My, my, th my <coughs> philosophy is, even though there's not a lot of money in lifestyle and sexual medicine, I, I know it's picking up. It will never be the point where I want it to be because I'm completely obsessed with it. But I think, before we move on to the next subject, I think it makes everything also, exercise and all these other things, also make the drugs work better. I think it makes the penile rehab. I think it makes the injections work better. I, I think that's been proven preliminarily in some studies, but don't you agree it's, the idea is if you're doing all these medications, you're doing procedures and you're helping guys and they're not doing something to help themselves, it's gotta be frustrating. Yeah, so I think it's worthwhile reiterating one of the topics I talked about in the lecture, and yeah. that is adrenaline is the world's most potent anti-erection chemical, right? Most potent anti-erection chemical. Stress, frustration, anxiety, lack of confidence. As a man, we're only as good as our last erection. If our last erection is bad, we walk into the bedroom the next time with anticipatory anxiety, right? And then things fail a second, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth time. And then, men will come in and say, well, it's not just when I'm with my partner, even on my own, because every erection becomes a test. So as much as we have these medications that can help, 15% of men with psychogenic ED do not respond well to pills. So high is the adrenaline load in the bedroom. That's human nature. That the reality is, I, I say to men, are you a golfer? Yeah. Do you know what the yips are? So worrying about missing a three-foot putt, right? Tiger Woods went through that. That's the same in the bedroom. Uh -huh. Whether or not you like the idea, it is a form of performance, right? Yeah. And so that's a real challenge. So we see lots of men with physically-based ED, they were doing fine. They yeah. weren't as rigid as they were 20 years ago, but they were doing fine. And now they've had one or two bad episodes and that's it. And so confidence restoration is important. Okay. And it's an opportunity for us to help them with lifestyle modification, et cetera. But that's a very important message, not just for patients, partners need to understand that too, yeah. right? But also the non-sexual medicine physician needs to understand that. I wanna talk about two things that impact lifestyle then we'll move on to the next slide. I personally believe, and we've done this at PCRI a lot, we've brought a lot of attention to alcohol. And I understand that when we were younger to have a couple beers and do this, but we've sort of become a nation consumed by alcohol and moderation is now, the name moderation has changed. Moderation is just a lot more than what it used to be, it seems. And it's a lot more prevalent at all age groups. And I don't know if you want to comment on it, but alcohol and sexual function, yeah. Does it get enough attention? So it's a, it gets almost no attention, actually, to be honest with you. So there are several things to talk about. First of all, if you're using a Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, or Stendra, yeah. you're supposed to not be having a lot of alcohol. Why? Okay. Those drugs drop your blood pressure. A lot of alcohol drops your blood pressure also. The two together are bad. Okay. Right? Number two, alcohol uh, for Viagra, Levitra, and Stendra slow the absorption. 
there is a, a gastric paralysis, gastroparesis, yeah. right? I take, uh, I take a glass of wine to help digestion. The idea is it slows down gastric emptying. Now the pill sits in your stomach with the food and it takes a while to get absorbed. So you just have to be cautious, right? That's why I said when you're using Viagra, Levitra, and Stendra, take it two hours before meal or cocktails or dinner, right? So the pill is in and out of the stomach before. Right? Okay. If you have massive amounts of alcohol, which will vary depending on who you are and your bulk and your alcohol history, it suppresses the trigger centers in the brain, the medial preoptic area, the paraventricular nucleus in the brain, which initiate the spark plugs of erection, right? Right. But if you're somebody who's got high levels of adrenaline, having a glass of wine might take the edge off things. It's a social lubricant. A glass. So it's a bipolar kind of yeah. uh, effect that alcohol has. Okay. Right? I'm not advocating the use of alcohol to suppress your anxiety walk into the bedroom, but it's reality. What about all this talk about marijuana? I think very much in the sense that um, you know, alcohol will be social lubricant. I think in whatever dose is going to get you in a more relaxed state, it takes the edge off things for those men with high levels of adrenaline. I work in Manhattan. Right. right? You can't imagine how many high adrenaline men, young men I have come in to see me, right? Yeah. And high adrenaline turns off erectile function, causes the penis to shrink. So many of these young men who are getting penile augmentation procedures really just have hypertonia, high tone, contractility of the penis based on adrenaline, okay? So it's a muscle and you'll feel them, their, their penis feels naughty. Yeah. But N-O-T-T-Y, uh, K-N-O-T-T-Y, right? You grab the, the, the head, the glands of the penis, you stretch, perfect stretch, right? Their muscle is healthy. They're just super high adrenaline. And a lot of these men are going to have sexual dysfunction. I thought, I thought though, because they're increasing the content of THC and all these other things, that it's going to be a problem in terms of creating erectile dysfunction, these substances. There, there's no credible evidence that THC interferes with erectile physiology, right? Okay. Now, I suspect that there just hasn't been the research done on super physiologic doses yeah. of THC, right? Um, but at this point in time, I would not look upon it as a, as a negative Okay. In that space. Let's shift to a different topic. Another one of my favorites is the over-the-counter space. Yeah. The over-the-counter space in our lifetime is becoming, it has become a billion dollar space. People want their products to get over the counter, especially when they become generic. Yeah. And I know there's been talk in a lot of countries of putting Viagra and all yeah. these, right? And yeah. I, over the counter. Yeah. But what happened in the past few months is something did come over the counter. Can you go to the next slide? I, I have no involvement with this company. It's called, it, this product's actually called Med3000. It's a Roxon, I could be pronouncing that. It's gonna be for sale now in the next few months, an <coughs> over-the-counter product that's being allowed to intimate that it helps with erectile function. And it's a lubricant, right? It's a gel. And so can you just talk the pros and cons of the first ever over-the-counter FDA cleared or FDA gave a thumbs up to letting this be sold over the counter. Let me take one step back to talk about the concept of over the counter or behind the counter. Yeah. Right behind the counter being where you have to speak to at least a pharmacist before you can get the medication. The problem with Viagra type drugs, right, is the very dangerous interaction with nitroglycerin medications yes. or with guanylate cyclase activators. Nitroglycerin for chest pain, angina, guanylate cyclase activators for pulmonary hypertension. They cause massive blood pressure drops. The average blood pressure drop, 100 milligrams of Viagra, standard sublingual dose of nitroglycerin is 30 points. For you and I, we're gonna to have to lie down, we're gonna get dizzy. For somebody with coronary artery disease who's using nitroglycerin, that might be a myocardial infarction, heart yeah. attack, or it might be a cardiac arrest, right? So that's the challenge in that space. The second thing is that there's a 30% placebo response rate in ED drug trials. If you take the Viagra trials, the FACE-V trials, the Levitra Cialis trials, you'll see 25 to 35 percent of men using placebo gave themselves much better scores. I mean, think about that. That's one out of every three men. That's a tribute to the fact that even men with physically based ED yeah. have a secondary psychological component, right? Yes. So if you give them uh, aspirin, you know, 325 milligrams of aspirin, and say this is the latest new drug in ED, oh. a third of them are going to say, you know, I'm better. And that tapers right. off over the course of a month or so, right? So a Roxxon, and, and in interest of full disclosure, I yeah. sat on an advisory panel with the company when they were doing their randomized placebo control trials. A Roxxon yeah. is the placebo gel from that trial. As you and I have talked about before, yeah. right? If you're using anything for ED, 
there's a chance you're gonna say it's better. Your erectile function's better, right? Placebo response. Yeah. Number two, if you're rubbing something on your genitalia, whether it's your penis for a man or your clitoris as a woman, and there are these products for women, yeah. You're causing digital stimulation, manual stimulation of the organ, which is going to arouse you and may lead to better erectile function. Second, thirdly, this is uh, menthol infused, so it's going to tingle, yeah. which is going to amplify the physical response, right? I think that for men who have physically based ED, the likelihood that this is going to help you significantly is very, very low. Okay. What, about, what about if someone's been treated for prostate cancer and says, hey, Dr. Molo, I just want to use it along with everything else. Do you have a problem with it? I wouldn't have a problem providing, you know, that becomes a, co uh, a price point issue. Yeah. Right, okay. So if it's not threatening to your wallet, then, you know, why wouldn't you use it? What I wouldn't want to happen is I wouldn't want men to go down this pathway for three, four months and bypass classic rehabilitation where they might end up hurting themselves. Yeah. Right. So here's another classic example in our practice. A man who comes in who is flagrantly incontinent. Right? He's leaking urine, six pads, diapers a day, wet, always wet, real problem, right? And puts off his sexual functional rehabilitation. That hurts that man in the long term. Yeah, that's good so we point. say to those men, don't, you don't have to have activity, right? I don't care if you have sex, I don't care if you have an orgasm. What I do care, blood flow, oxygen, and stretch. Mm -hmm. So that would be my only concern of an over-the-counter supplement. Yeah. The challenge also with over-the-counter supplements, as you know, and it's kind of, a, I won't say threatening, but I'm speaking to the world authority oh, on, I don't know. on, on I nutraceuticals, that. right? Yeah. I... But the challenge is, as you know, many of these over-the-counter male supplements have included in them Viagra levitra cialis yeah, in generic form. Contaminated, right? yeah. And if you don't want to use those pills because your doctor says, oh, you're on nitroglycerin, you shouldn't use those pills, you must be very careful looking at those agents because they might actually contain the drug that in combination with nitroglycerin is going yeah. to hurt you. And then these other men's health supplements will, will contain other androgens, right? DHEA will be the classic one, right? Yeah. And I learned, and you correct me if I'm wrong, many years ago that most of the DHEA in the United States of America is derived from the Mexican yam and it's not, not bioavailable, right? So, you know, I think we just have to be very careful and counsel our patients very carefully. But it's very easy, $39.99, you can return it, men never do. And so they try it, but just be cautious about what's in there. And I think I remember you saying that there's a proportion of these products that say they've got X, Y, and Z that don't have any of X, right. Y, and Z in there. That's right. right. So just be aware of that as you're thinking about these supplements. Yeah, I've come to the point where if there's no quality control seal that proves that what they're advertising is actually in the product, I don't think people should purchase it. And people say, well, the quality control seals cost a little more money, but you know they're worth it, especially in the ED space. But I do, you know, I. Since the last time I talked to you, I am more excited about the ED space over the counter. I know that you deal with, I'm sure you get questions about this, L-citrulline, some people talk about L-arginine, but I think the message that gets missed is that in the actual trials when these products work over the counter, they're just using those most of the time as single ingredients and they're cheap. The idea that someone's gotta spend a fortune over the counter and work with you makes no sense to me. Yeah, I, I think that um, there's no, and I say this, with my scientific hat on. Yeah. I have no conflict of interest, I have no relationship with any pharmaceutical industry company yeah. at this point in time. There is no credible evidence that an oral agent is of any benefit to erectile function. In fact, the American Urological Association guidelines say it, right? that nutraceuticals really should not be used. There's no role for them at this point in time. Yeah, I think the bad players have kind of crowded out the good players. And my hope is that in our next conversation we'll talk about a couple of trials that are showing some benefit. <laughs> but I, I think it's a good point to cover. I want to play a new game with you. It's, I have two <laughs> games I want to play here with you. One's called the con and pro game. I love the con and pro game because it makes you think of the catch first versus the benefit. So we talk about the benefit second. So let's talk con and pro with Dr. Moyad. We already talked about lifestyle. Pro. It's very pro, right? Now I want to start going through some of the options. But the first thing I want to talk about is the thing that confuses me the most about penile rehabilitation, I think confuses most people watching, is if they're about to be treated for radiation or they're about to be treated for anything, they don't know what to ask for in terms of penile rehab. Does Mohal think that means a pill? It means an injection? It means a vacuum device? Does it mean one or the other? How, what am I even suggesting to my doctor of the type of rehab I need to be on pre, during, and after? So can you help me with that? What everybody out there should be asking their doctor to do before they start their treatment? 
So we always start our patients prior to surgery or radiation on low-dose PD-5 inhibitors, right? So like so Viagra? Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, Stendra. And is there one you favor over another? Most of our patients are using either Viagra, which is Sildenafil, or Tadalafil, which is Cialis, okay. right? Okay. Um, but regular, meaning nightly. Okay, and the purpose of that is endothelial preconditioning. I'm taking this every single night before my treatment is what We you're do it saying. for two weeks before their treatment two starts. Two weeks right? before, okay. And by the way, for the radiation patient who gets ADT, that's two weeks before they start ADT. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then after. Is that how you should think before you start any other treatment or add on? You should keep thinking rehab, what else can I add here? Well, I don't think you need to do much additive. What, what you really need is you need endothelial protection, uh -huh. smooth muscle protection, both of which are done by PD5 inhibitors, and then erection. So everything that's good for your penis occurs during erection. Yeah. Right? And so in the early stages after treatment, we want them to try maximum dose. If they're getting a penetration level erection. Maximum dose. Right? Okay. Then that's all they need to do. As I said in the lecture, the vast majority of people do not get penetration rigidity uh, post prostatectomy with a, a maximum dose PD5 inhibitor. The vast majority of people after radiation, if they haven't had ADT, will respond beautifully to a PD5 inhibitor. If they're not a PD5 inhibitor, or after radiation, when they stop being a PD5 inhibitor, then they go on to the next treatment, which is injection therapy. This is after you've been treated? Yes. So the, 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 one, you want, the one pharmacologic agent you want to focus on before your treatment is Cialis Levitra. There's no necessarily add-on at that point, no, besides listen, lifestyle. If you say to me you're not getting any good, well, I, in an ideal world, yeah. what we would do is we take men who had hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, structural sleep apnea, diabetes, low T, and you'd fix that. Yeah, you cure that. Before their treatment, <laughs> right? And if yeah. you've got a Gleason 3 plus 4 organ confined cancer that's low volume on your core, you know, 4 of 12 biopsies are positive, you could probably put that off for 3 to 6 months and address those things, right? But that is not yet mainstream. I would like to see that mainstream in the future, okay. right? Yeah. But the bottom line is that PD-5 inhibitors protect your penis. Just their presence. You don't need an erection to do that. And I want max dose. Right? After, sur after surgery, after radiation, you want to challenge them and make sure they're getting really good erections. And that will require maximum dose. And 85% of prostatectomy patients will not respond in the first three to six months. But how long am I staying on max dose after treatment? And so if I've had surgery or radiation, am I staying on it, am I gonna at least go six to 12 months? Yeah, so let's break out the, the, the different modalities. Okay. So with surgery, as the nerves recover over an 18 to 24 month period, I've told you 15% respond to pills at month two, let's say. Yeah. That number, if you're under 60 years of age, good function before surgery, good nerve sparing is 80, 75, 80% at two years. So there's a whole inversion. So the vast majority of men who go on to injection therapy after prostatectomy, get off injection therapy. I see. Right? Yeah. After radiation, given that it's a three-year nadir, right, the low point in erectile function is three years after radiation, then many patients don't need to use pills early on, but by the third year, they have to take their maximum dose pill because yeah. they're no longer getting a good erection, right? So it's about use of PD-5 inhibitors regularly, okay. which is just good for erect. It's good for endothelium, right? Yeah. So I don't know if you were of Bob Cloner's paper that came out early this year showing using a very large database that using regular use of PD-5 inhibitors reduces the risk of myocardial events, of heart attacks and strokes, okay? We've known this for a long time, and I think, yeah, there you go, exactly it. And, you know, the, the pharmaceutical up. industry dropped a massive ball, massive ball, by not exploring this. Like statins have been explored, yeah. PD-5 inhibitors should have been explored, okay? So I think, PD-5 inhibitors are good for your penis, getting erections, penetration hardness. Why penetration hardness? Because that's our average nighttime erection. There must be something evolutionarily, developmentally, yeah. to us getting nighttime erections that are around penetration hardness, oxygen and stretch. Yeah. So that's why we drive people to get penetration hardness in our rehab program. Okay, so I'm taking this pill, right? So the, the paper he's referring to was in the Journal of Sexual Medicine 2023. Uh, this was, and it was a paper published with a lot of different authors, but it was Cloner et al., right? And I love this last statement. It says there was a lower incidence in this large data set. There was a lower incidence taking Viagra and these type of drugs of major adverse cardiovascular events, cardiovascular death, and overall mortality. In other words, it improved the chances that you would just live longer. Now, if that's a drug that just came out, there would be an advertisement every day on TV, That's why I said the and it was such a powerful paper. I didn't even discuss this with you before I saw you today that I brought it in and I wanted you to comment on it 
It's just, just unbelievable. And so... But in the phase three trials for Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis, yeah. if you look at the treatment arm, there were thousands of people in these trials. It wasn't just one trial, but there were many trials over, over several years done before and early after uh, approval. The myocardial infarction, heart attack rate, in those men getting the drug was lower than the placebo arm. Right? Well, well established, well known. Yeah. We've known this for years. They are potent endothelial protectants. But I think there's a huge confusion that doctors, some doctors have caused when you take these drugs for rehab. So some of people will think that every time I take them every day, I have to have sex. No. Or do I have to stimulate or self-stimulate that area? They don't understand what it means during rehab when I take the pill. So you're just saying you take the pill like you take a daily vitamin. Like a vitamin. So you don't have Going to stimulate. Going to bed at night. You don't have to, you don't have to see something on TV that oh. stimulates. You don't have to self-stimulate. You don't have to have sex. Right. So if you're taking it seven days a week, you're just popping it at night. You said at night, right? Yeah. And then that's it. Because it might induce a nighttime erection. Yeah. Right? That's what yeah, we do at night. That's brilliant. So the, uh, there's very good evidence yeah. looking at a, a technique called flow media dilation, which looks at the ability for a blood vessel yeah, to expand, dilation, right? Yeah. That's an endothelial function, right? If you take low-dose Viagra, 25 milligrams, every night for 14 nights, right? Your endothelium is protected for at least 24 hours after the last dose, right? If you do that with Cialis, your yeah. endothelium is protected for a period of two weeks after the last dose. So these drugs are endothelium protective, even just their presence. They bathe your endothelium. That's exciting. And the only other thing I want to add, and I don't know if you want to comment on it, besides this paper saying this can help you live longer, they're now looking at funding some trials in terms of people that have cognitive issues, in terms of improving cognitive performance in terms of increasing blood flow to the brain. So I don't know if that's gone anywhere, but. So I'll, tell, I'll say what I say to my patients. Mr. Jones, the further I get away from the penis, the less expert I am. All right, so that helps me, except, all right, I'm gonna take it every day, and it's such an important point. I don't have to self-stimulate, let right. me repeat that. I don't have to have sex. I'm taking it like a nightly vitamin, but I'm taking the max dose, because there's doctors, depending on the doctor, they have different, they have different rehab programs. The nightly dose is low dose. Okay, the nightly dose is low dose. But the literature would suggest that two to three erections per week uh -huh. are protective of our erectile tissue. Remember, we get three to six every night, right? right. So you're getting 21, all right, you're a 45 year old healthy man, you're getting 21 erections at least every week of your life, right? So you, okay. But the literature would suggest that two to three erections per week after prostatectomy are protective. They improve erectile function recovery. So it's nightly low dose. Nightly low dose. Okay. And two or three times a week, we want you taking a big dose okay. to get an erection. That you need to be taking, uh, you need to be stimulating. Remember, for Viagra and, and Levitra, dinner at seven, take it at five, good till after midnight. Thanks for correcting me. Nightly low dose and then a higher dose a couple times a week, that's what you recommend. Mm -hmm. Okay, if that's so great for your penis mm -hmm. and your overall health, why do people, why don't people just use other things along with that right after treatment or during? Why don't they just use the erection device, vacuum erection? Why don't they just go to, to injections early? Because injections are so helpful. Sure. Why do I got to wait around for a couple of weeks? Why can't I just start injections a so, couple of weeks later? So first of all, there's no sexual activity two weeks after surgery. You have to okay. catheter her in and we, there's an anastomosis. We want to protect that. We give them four weeks then to try maximum dose pill. At six weeks, we're supposed to see them. If they come in at six weeks, the pill's not working, straight to injections. Okay. Pill's working, great. You okay. continue with the pill, maximum dose pills, just get erections, okay? So that's the general flow. The vacuum device doesn't oxygenate the penis, right? I'm a big fan of the concept of oxygenation of the penis, yeah. right? Now, this is not oxygenation from the outside. There was a company, I don't know, more than a decade ago who developed a little oxygen tent for the penis that you put over your penis at night. That's not the oxygen we're talking about. It's the oxygen in the blood that occurs during erection, yeah. right? And so this beautiful balance, physiology is amazing. Beautiful balance between flaccidity and erection. For the healthy man, no problem. The erection protects the penis. Yeah. But if you go through a state of chronic flaccidity, I haven't got an erection in six months, right? Post prostatectomy, yeah. that's bad. Now the muscle degenerates. So, but, so it seems like in your world, you're using the injections earlier. We use injections you're not, you're as early as six weeks after surgery. Six weeks is early, and so that's an important to, to ask about that once right. you hit that six week time period. But well, because the vacuum device does not oxygenate the penis, we don't utilize vacuum device therapy as part of our rehabilitation. You don't? We do not. You, d you don't? You there are two papers in the literature, the Dalkin and the Kohler paper, which yeah. show very nicely. You can preserve penile length 
with a vacuum device. Okay. You can also preserve penile length by daily PD5 inhibitors, right? Yeah. But there's no evidence to show that vacuum devices increases the ability for man to get back to baseline or spontaneous erectile function. So your rehab program is lifestyle, the pill, Possibly um, injections. In the injections. Yeah. And then what about Muse? You know, it's been yeah. around for a while. They so so Muse is, is barely available anymore, yeah. right? Yeah. So it, it, for most, most places, it's not available. The problem with Muse is it's pure prostaglandin yeah. at max, at really high doses, right? The maximum dose is 1,000 micrograms, right? And prostaglandin is a pain mediator. That's why we take things like ibuprofen. It's an anti-prostaglandin drug, right? Yeah. And so these patients post prostatectomy or post-cystectomy, or post low anterior resection for rectal cancer, get terrible burning pain in their penis, right? Yeah. Because of the prostaglandin with Muse. So we don't use it. Yeah, it's, it's not, not very popular. effective, it's not very consistent, but really the reason is that we don't use it because of penile pain. All right, here's what I want to ask you though, since you taught me about this, the rehab stuff. Is it possible to talk to you after the program that we can put up as a part of your, as a part of your lecture today, just your basic rehab protocol? Is it okay? I can send you a slide, you can which you can include it in I just this think, session. I just think this confuses the HE yep. double toothpicks out of everyone, just rehab. What am I supposed to ask for? What's the dose? How often? Which drug do you like best? Should I include the injections? You say six weeks. I mean, all these things yeah, there, there are is bullet no, points that have to be taken to the doctor. There is no pills that I prefer over the other. And well, I'll, we'll include a slide, yeah. Really quick comment on these. I, I found this old ad. Yeah. It's a Viagra ad, and what I found so intriguing about it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you also, we also have to educate the fact that these pills make your equipment, let me, for lack of a better term, they make your equipment work better potentially, but they don't necessarily make you want to use your equipment more. Yeah. So one thing that's not talked about in this space, we always talk about function, 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 but I don't think we talk enough about sex drive. Right. Right? So do you have any comment on that? Yeah. So sex drive is very easy to talk about because there are only three causes of sex drive issues, right? There are medications. Yeah. So any psychotropic medication. If you've got a history of anxiety disorder, depression, mental health problems, and you're on drugs, for example, like Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, right? SSRI yeah. drugs. Psychotropic drugs are a problem, okay? Other drugs are anti-testosterone drugs, estrogenic drugs, potentially. And then 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, okay? So... Uh, finasteride and dutasteride. Uh, in the trials done for BPH, uh, men, older men with large prostates, 5% of men had low sex drive, right? right? So there's drugs. Number two, hormones, right? Low testosterone, hypothyroidism, hyperprolactinemia, a, tumor, uh, a, a chemical that comes from the brain, a hormone that comes from the brain that's associated with benign tumors in the brain. So you just measure testosterone, you measure thyroid function, and you measure prolactin. Yeah. And then number three, psychological. And that's a big umbrella term for many, many different things. So when the man who's low sex drive is related to the fact that he's got AED, yeah. in those men you put them on a drug that facilitates erections, you may well see improved sex drive mm. because their sex drive was related to the fact they're low confidence walking into the bedroom. Now that I've got erections back, hey, and the frequency activity goes up in those men. But it is not a libidogenic drug, it's not an orgasmogenic drug, it is an erectogenic drug. I want to pause for moho moments. That means I want some wisdom from these things. Will you please comment just on the neurovascular bundles? And the reason why I'm so shocked at how many people get treatment, there's never a discussion of neurovascular bundles and the role they play, not just in erectile function, but possibly continence. I, I think this is on the Mohol checklist that you have to talk about neurovascular bundles during your consult. Can you just comment on that? Yeah, so the neurovascular bundles in the book, I described them as tiny microscopic fiber optic cables Yes. that are embedded in a layer of saran wrap that's wrapped around the prostate that you need to think of like an orange. Okay. And that orange is going to be removed, so you have to split the saran wrap and pull it apart, and that traction or percussion injury causes stretch of those nerves and those nerves go to sleep. Okay. Those nerves are the lifeline to erections, all right? Yes. There are multiple different layers. Fascia is the term we use in medicine, right? There are different layers, and depending on which layer you're in during the prostatectomy, the surgeon should be able to tell the patient, yes. right? Whether they were intrafascial, extrafascial, interfascial, how much nerve damage there was. At our institution and at some other institutions, there are grading systems. One, two, three, four, one the best, four the worst at our institution. That's on the up note. I see it. Mr. Jones, you're a one and a three, okay? 
I will tell you, and there are neurologic oncologists who will disagree with this statement. Yeah. I don't believe that the neurovascular bundles are intrinsically involved in continence. I do believe that the level of dissection at the very bottom, the apex of the prostate, the bottom yeah. is called the apex, is what's involved. And if there's a lot of extra or unnecessary or aggressive dissection there, the neurovascular bundles will be damaged, but so will the continence mechanism. You're damn so they right. Go, it's an association right. rather than causation. Yeah. Don't shouldn't you discuss that for radiation treatment too? Because radiation can damage the neurovascular bundles. The they? least important factor in the radiation patient is the nerves, right? The okay. blood vessels, hugely important. The muscle. About 40% of radiation given to the prostate gets delivered to the, the back one inch of the penis because it sits right under the prostate. There's a layer called the urogenital diaphragm, which varies between a centimeter and two centimeter. The bigger, the longer your urogenital diaphragm, the less radiation you get, right? So about 40% of the radiation delivered to the prostate gets to the back of the penis. So it's the muscle damage there, and it's the blood vessel damage because radiation damages endothelium. So then rehab after radiation would be just as important as rehab after surgery. It's actually surgery. more important. More important. And we have much better data more in a radiation patient with PD-5 inhibitors. Randomized control trial for Memorial Sloan Kettering showing two-year preservation of sexual function better in men who use pills versus placebo. Uh -huh. So we have better data in the radiation patient because the primary means that radiation causes damage is endothelial, endarteritis obliterans. Okay. Called. And what about antigen deprivation therapy? What's your pre, what's your rehab, your pithy rehab program for yeah. people to yeah. just go on ADT yeah. or any sort of hormone therapy? So again, start beforehand, the concept of prehab, yeah. endothelial preconditioning, okay. because you know, no sex drive, uh, almost no sex drive, very challenging getting an orgasm, but the big thing is collagenization of smooth muscle. You need some testosterone for the muscle to stay healthy, right? You don't need a lot of testosterone for the muscle to stay healthy, but when you've no testosterone, that muscle reflexly turns to collagen and that leads to a leaky valve in your penis. Mr. Jones, your penis is like a bicycle tire, two hoses going in and a muscle that contracts to control the valve. Blood stays in there, it can't leak. We have an orgasm, the valve opens. That muscle controls the valve. When that muscle degenerates, blood flows in, flows out, flows in, flows out, and that's called venous leak, V-E-N-O-U-S leak. Yeah, okay, so the, you're, doing, you're doing rehab when you're on antigen deprivation therapy. Let's say you yes. come off of it, you get some testosterone back, can I regain my function? And can I regain, because you taught me that on hormone therapy, you, you, you lose not only length, possibly, but width. Volume. Volume. Yeah. Yeah, penile volume. Do I ever get that back? If, if you have penile volume loss after being exposed to ADT, that is invariably the result of collagenization of smooth muscle, and that's a permanent phenomenon. That's why we do rehab. You can't come back a year later and say, okay, now I'm ready to start. Yeah. You really have to do it preemptively. Dry orgasm, climacteria, can you just, I heard it again from someone just the other day. You know, I was very happy with my treatment, but I had no idea that my orgasms would be dry. Okay. Shouldn't that be mandatory discussion before the treatment? So as I alluded to in the lecture, you never know if somebody says, that's the first time I've heard of it, where they told that and didn't receive the information because they're so oncocentric in that pre-therapy phase, yeah. right? Uh, or they just went told it. But there's literature showing 40% of men, when inquired within three months after surgery, don't remember ever being told, they will not ejaculate. Okay. The ejaculation apparatus is gone. So it's orgasm, but no ejaculation. For gay men, that's very challenging. There's a lot of ejaculatory distress among gay men because they don't ejaculate anymore. One third of straight men will say, this is a real bother in my life, mm. okay? So it's not something that's talked about by, unless you come see me preoperatively yeah. and we will talk about that. You should have an orgasm. Most men don't understand that if you've no erection, you can still have an orgasm. Technically, you don't need a penis to have an orgasm because you know, when you, have, when you were younger and you had nocturnal emissions, right? Yeah. There was no sexual stimulation, it was just brain driven, right? But you should have an orgasm, but invariably early on at least, the orgasmic, the nature and intensity of the orgasm is not what it was before. At two years after surgery, 50% of men will say it's less intense than it was before surgery. 40% will say it's about the same. It feels different, but the intensity is about the same. And surprisingly and consistently, 10% of men say the intensity is more. It's okay. greater intensity after surgery. So I'm having a dry orgasm after surgery. What am I having after radiation and what am I having after hormone therapy? Am I having... So you can't make semen okay. unless you've got testosterone. 
So they just don't produce semen. So the machinery is no intact, okay. but they don't produce semen, okay. right? After radiation, 90% of men by the fifth year after radiation will have no ejaculation. Okay. Just basically contraction and scarring of the prostate and ejaculatory ducts. But like you said, rehab is just as important in those situations. Let's go to the next slide, please. I'm sorry, but this is all the rage out here in California and other places. Yeah. And, and I actually saw this from the AUA and I saw your name on some places. People have to understand there's this low intensity shockwave therapy and it's applied to the penis. It's, you know, so shockwave, shockwave therapy, therapy like a kidney stone, but it's actually on the penis. for stone disease, okay. right? Then, uh, more than a decade ago, probably 15 plus years ago, shockwave therapy, low intensity shockwave therapy, was applied to uh, infarcted myocardium with improvement in recovery. So, oh my goodness, we should be applying a low intensity shockwave therapy to muscle. The penis is a big muscle, so that's how it got used in, in erectile dysfunction. Okay. There are about 16 large papers in, in the literature on shockwave therapy. Half of them are randomized control trials, half of them are observational studies. Okay? Okay. There are several that show no benefit, most of them show mediocre benefit. And so at this point in time, the Sexual Medicine Society of North America, yeah. the AUA, the American Urological Association, say yeah. that these therapies, shockwave therapy, stem cell therapy, and PRP, platelet-rich plasma, should be used under an IRB, so an ethics committee saying yeah. yes you can do this and patients should not be charged. The reality is however that there are many many practices that are charging people cash yes. for this. There is a concern, theoretical concern, that shockwave therapy or stem cell therapy for example may reactivate cancer because they're kind of growth factor, that's how they function, yeah, the growth they're growth factor, they promote growth factors and that so if you have a pelvic cancer and you're getting shockwave therapy to your penis, or you're using PRP, or you're using stem cell therapy. These have not been studied extensively in prostate cancer or cancer patients in general. And what about these wands, these pulse wave devices? You, you, you can buy them on TV. You're supposed to take the wand and apply it yourself. It's, yes. Uh, I mean, it is capitalism at its finest, okay. right? Okay, so the problem is that a shockwave therapy, if you look at the, sh at the wave, yeah. it's got a spike. And it's got an, 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 you know, it's got a certain amplitude to be considered yeah. a shockwave. Pulse waves are just these low little whatever. They do nothing. They might warm your penis up. Yeah. But they're not going to give you. They're not going to improve your erectile function. All right. All right. You mentioned this. You know, you you, you erectile dysfunction doctors have been a disappointment because I'll tell you why. I'm not, I'm not saying you. I'm just saying in general. You made us all excited about doing nerve graft. Remember the sural nerve graft and all these nerve grafts were gonna change men's erectile function after treatment. It was gonna be like stem cell, it was gonna change the game. It doesn't sound like this is going anywhere, you're saying, but you wanna comment on if this? I you... have, if I was having prostatectomy, yeah. and was going to have deliberate bilateral nerve resection, yeah. I would say to the surgeon, I would like you to do nerve grafting. Because you take men who have no chance of ever being a pure You would pure say? Pure. No chance of being a pill responder, bilateral nerve resection. Yeah. And you change that to about 10% of men will become pill responders, right? It's not 90%. Yeah. But if you're having bilateral deliberate nerve resection, I would ask to have nerve grafting done. The problem is that most people are not having bilateral nerve How resection. How am I going to get nerve grafting done? I know a doctor out in California that does it, so you just actually request that. Speak They're using to your prostate nerve graft as in stem cell nerve grafts? Oh, no, no, no. Nerve grafts, as in sural nerve grafting or genitofemoral nerve Oh, so nerve they're grafting. still using a nerve from a different part of the body right? and then applying it there. And, and you're, a, and a, and you're a fan surgeon. of it. You're a fan of it. That's well, awesome. Fan in, in the sense that it goes from zero to 10% ability to be a pill responder if you have bilateral deliberate nerve resection. Okay. This is not somebody who has a little bit of damage on one side and a little bit of damage on the other side. Yeah, that's, that's not used. Okay. You're looking for bad cancer, positive MRI. I can see on the MRI, we're going to take out a segment of nerve. Yes. Me, I would ask for nerve grafting. So I would ask for nerve grafting. It's autologous. They take it from somewhere in your body and they put it your in leg, the... Your leg, which is the sural, yes, or exactly. in the pelvis along the psoas muscle, the genofemoral nerve. That is interesting. You and I have never talked about that. Next slide. You, you talked about TRT, testosterone replacement, after cancer treatment. And I know Dr. Scholz will talk about this too in terms of another way. But do you want to comment briefly on the fact... Let's just step out of prostate for a second. There was this trial finally called the Traverse Trial. Mm -hmm that was supposed to show whether or not testosterone replacement therapy in men causes cardiac problems. Do you want to just comment on this sure, trial that sure. just published in the past few months? So first of all, uh, just to declare, I'm the chairman of the AUA guidelines on testosterone deficiency. Uh, of course you are. You're the chairman of everything. So the statement is clear, right? Yeah. A man who has low testosterone should be told, we had cardiologists on the panel, yeah. A man with low testosterone should be told that low testosterone is a risk factor.
for coronary artery events, major adverse cardiovascular events. The presence of low testosterone, right? Now, if you use 300 as a normal cutoff, really that literature is most robust for men with T levels below 200. So the presence of low testosterone is a risk factor for MACE, major adverse cardiovascular yeah. events. There isn't yet enough literature to show that testosterone replacement therapy, testosterone therapy, prostatectomy, radiation, active surveillance is safe. We have about 500 men now with Gleason 6, Gleason 7 organ confined cancer. We have about close to 200 men with high risk disease, 100 and something men on active surveillance, 100 and something men on radiation. There is no signal at this point in time that it's a risk. However, you probably need 85,000 man follows for 15 years yeah. to really answer that question. So they did this trial, they said, so. 6,000 men, almost 6,000 men, no increased risk of cardiovascular events. Okay, no increased risk of cardiovascular events. That's what I saw, especially came, people came out and said that in the press, especially those who have some conflict of interest. So what I mean by that is that there's other things I, that, that were not mentioned about that trial, and I wonder how you're teasing this out. There was a higher rate overall of pulmonary embolism in the people in, on the testosterone. There was a higher rate of atrial fibrillation. There was a higher rate of acute kidney injury. And I know it was a, just a tiny bump higher, but is, isn't that making us, that make us nervous? It wasn't clinically meaningful. Okay. Right? There was an increase in the absolute numbers, uh, relative numbers, but not really in the absolute numbers. Right? Okay. Biological plausibility is critical, right? Uh -huh. There has to be a mechanism by which testosterone might cause kidney damage, et cetera. It doesn't. It doesn't induce atrial fibrillation, right? And so I think they're kind of, that's a bit of background noise. Okay, the, that's the, good to know. The clots, the pulmonary embolism is a, is a significant issue, right? Yes. But in the trials, there was no control for the T levels. And if you're on intramuscular testosterone of high peak levels, you're more at risk for having, um, uh, let's say polycythemia, which is high hemoglobin. And that might be a risk factor for these clot phenomena. Well, it sounds like the trial made you feel a little more comfortable that it's not heart unhealthy, I've right? never been heart, uh, be worried. Never, okay. Because if you take the four papers out, the Basaria, Finkel, Weigand, and G paper out of the literature, yeah. with regard to cardiovascular events, every treatment, every study is neutral or shows that there's a reduction in cardiovascular events. That's good to know, but I will tell you, I'm going to play Monday morning quarterback again on this trial that everybody's talking about. Not a single expert that I was aware of in the medical journal mentioned the average BMI of the man in that trial, which was 35. Sure. 35. Sure. So now let me play devil's advocate or angel's advocate. I'm going to go maybe on one of these new drugs to help you with weight loss. I'm going to lose 50 to 75 pounds, and my testosterone's going to go up. Why do I even need it? The amount of weight you need to lose to boost your testosterone to any clinically meaningful level is bariatric surgery. Okay. There's no evidence, this again is AWA guideline based, there's no evidence that losing 30 to 40 to 50 pounds is going to make a big difference in, in your testosterone. There's no evidence that doing exercise is going to improve your testosterone. Oh, resistant exercise is good, yeah, but the amount of T change is really minimal. Okay. okay? So I think the future is bright in trials that are looking at s different endpoints for the GLP-1 agonists. Okay, I was just wondering, because there are a lot of guys out there in the prostate world too who are on testosterone replacement and they don't have BMIs of 35. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. one of those guys- But if you took the low testosterone population in general, Mark, yeah. okay, they're going to have high BMIs, right? Yes, it's absolutely. be a higher instance of diabetes absolutely. and uh, being uh, severely overweight. So yeah. that, that's not surprising to me, right? Okay. You're kind of the Conor McGregor of urology. I just want to, and that's in a good way. <laughs> I don't have that. No, body. what I'm saying is, I mean, you don't have that kind of money and that, but body. you have, oh, body, I thought. That kind of body. I don't know, I think you're a pretty handsome guy. That's my dog, I was wanted to, I started Grazie. with my dog and yes. I wanted to, Grazie, and I wanted to finish with my dog. All right, 30, 30 seconds, anything that I miss. Kegel exercises, do you even think men should do Kegel exercises? For continence, yes. For and, erectile function, absolutely not. Okay. There's no good evidence that pelvic floor therapy improves erectile function and by a lot from a biological plausibility standpoint okay there's no link between the two okay there's one thing we didn't mention that you actually know a lot about and i think it's a good way to move toward end this is Peyronie's disease okay and and how long do you have well no but the only reason i'm just mentioning it is just an awareness comment and are you a fan of the injections that have come out that now people are seeing all these tv commercials do you want to just provide your sort of take on Yes. This condition, what is it? Erroneous disease Why is, is it a important? genetic condition okay. that occurs predominantly in European Caucasians. It's very uncommon in African Americans and very uncommon in Asians. It is a scarring phenomenon that uh, the scar occurs in the outer lining of the erection chamber called the tunica albuginea. Okay. There's a scar, it doesn't expand. 
Man has a scar on the top surface of his penis. As he's getting an erection, the penis gets tugged, curved over to that side. 40% of men have pain. Pain nearly all goes, goes away. The biggest problem is that many men have curvature that precludes them having sexual intercourse. So there's physical impairment, and nearly every man has psychological bother, with 35% of men having depression at the time of presentation with Peyronie's disease. If you have Peyronie's disease, if you think you have Peyronie's disease, go see a Peyronie's disease expert. Not every urologist loves Peyronie's disease in their practice. Yeah. Okay? Sexual Medicine Society of North America, smsna.org to find one of those. Beautiful. And Peyronie's disease, do you see it after prostate treatment ever? The risk of Peyronie's disease is increased after radical prostatectomy. Okay? That's accumulating yet to be published data. Listen, uh, I thought, what's a gift that no one has ever given you? <laughs> that only the on, people on the inside that know the great mall hall could give them. And I wanted, I want to see if you can catch this gift, which is kind of serious. I, we went, in PCRI, money is no object. We'll, we'll skip mortgages if we have to, to get gifts to our speakers. I, we've actually found this cup finally from Ireland. And it's from a town in Ireland. Ring a skitty, yeah. Sure. Ring a skitty. Yeah. Have you heard of it? Sure. Of course I have. <laughs> Do you know? Ring a skitty. Do you know why ring a skitty? So Ireland is important to you. You may move back there one day or spend, you spend a lot of time there, but ring a skitty has an important place in urology because I read that the big, tell me if I'm wrong here, I read that the big factory that makes- Pfizer. The, 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 the largest producer of Viagra around the world is in ring a skitty. Is that true? Uh, I think it's the largest center in Europe, and it's purported that after the introduction of Viagra in 1998, the birth rate went up in the Ring of Skitty area. So can you hold up that cup? You have a Ring of Skitty Ireland cup, sure. so which yeah. is associated yes. with yes. Dr. Mulhall and Viagra and all treasure. I'll put are... this alongside my gold cystoscope. <laughs> Listen, I'm glad you're here. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm Thank glad you, you're doing well. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank I really appreciate you. My pleasure. Time. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm going to run to the end. All right, you're going to run. Mm -hmm.